showing up this evening. I'm going to give you just a couple of seconds, or maybe 30 or so, to, to get comfortable. The music in the background. Hail Jack. Uh, what, what we have done, first off, is I want to thank all of you for showing up tonight. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, this is the, the first input section of the Bicycle Master Plan since it has been written in first draft. Um, there's a few people that were hugely instrumental in this. First, we started off with, with Maurice Lardans and Ian Webb and a few others painting Cheros on Presswell and Marshall and Crockett leading to the to the Clyde Fan Parkway a long time ago. And that was really the first step in moving to the bicycle plan. Every 10 years NLCOG does a, a submission to the federal government on our bicycle plan. And there was a very brief chapter in this giant plan on bicycle thoroughfares. I brought this to uh, Bike Shreveport and some of the various Better Shreveport meetings and it, I was, it was brought to my attention um, by first Isla Rolls, and so thank you very much Isla for bringing this to my attention and also Stephen Peterson who quickly followed up after that in that alternative to automobiles the money at the federal government level, it is there. However, it's there for alternatives to automobiles. It's not there for automobiles, it's not there for cars. And in order to take advantage of the alternative to automobile money, we have to submit to the federal government a form and a document that we, we did not have. And so it was at that point that I rallied the parish to come up with the funding for the Bicycle Master Plan that provided, through NL Cog, the means to go to the federal government and say, this is our plan, this is what we want to do, and to be able to attract the money. At the same time, we were looking for low-hanging fruit, which we want to capture just simply by what we have already done. The federal government was first, uh, the state of Louisiana was second, then Caddo Parish, then the city of Shreveport, then the MPC, and then NL Cog all adopted the complete streets approach to roads. And what this obligates us to is to look at bicycles as an alternative means of transportation so that when we go to restrike a road, we have to take into consideration can we restrike this road to make it more bicycle friendly? That is the low hanging fruit. When you get into these 80-20 matches, these are things that are major projects, million dollar projects, $100,000 projects, where the federal government would pay 80-20, and that's something that may take three, four years to actually see the implementation or the concrete or, or the pathways actually formed for us to ride our bicycles on them. One of the things about bicycles that I'm sure preaching to the choir, that all you realize is that bicycles transverse all socioeconomic backgrounds. Whether you're riding a $14,000 bicycle or whether you're riding your bicycle to a $14,000 job, everybody uses bicycles and we need these pathways to create a safer environment for the entire community. Um, we have had multiple deaths of people not just on bicycles, but even pedestrians, um, because the paths just simply aren't safe enough for us as a community. In recognizing economic development with bicycle pathways, you look at the millenniums. The millenniums are, are designated as your economic workforce. These are your 25 to 45 year olds that you want them and you have to have them in your community for your community to strive. The millenniums have, have flat out said that if you don't create the venues that we want, we're going to go where the venues are already in place. And so Shreveport and Caddo Parish definitely have to create the venues in order for this to happen. And, and that is, you know, with all of you rallying your, your parish commissioners and your city council and your mayor's office 
to, to make sure that this happens because it is the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. Um, with that, I'm going to tell you how this is going to flow. Immediately after I put this mic on, on the stand, um, Stephen Peterson, who was hugely, in, in, uh, hugely valuable in the implementation or the direction of this and giving Bud Melton, the designer of the plan, who is going to speak in just a little bit and answer questions and, and help guide this plan. Um, he's going to do a 15 minute presentation um, and then Bud Melton's going to come up. We're going to have Kent Rogers, um, Ken Ward with the parish, and Patrick Furlong with the city of Shreveport to answer any questions that you have. And what we hope is if you've already looked at the plan um, and you have certain things that you want addressed in this plan, and you can ask these questions or you can make these recommendations so that we, when we actually have a finished product, now this, this, finish, this product right now is, is still fluid, when we have a finished product, that it is a product that everybody in this room is proud of, and it's also a, a, something that is achievable by the parish and the city, so that there is some, there's some easy things that we can do with, with paint, and then there's some loftier goals that are gonna be set for later down the road. Again, I'm going to set the mic up and turn it over to Stephen. And thank you, every, thank you again, everyone, for showing up. And thank you, um, Bud, for doing such a, a wonderful plan and, and what I've seen so far. I really appreciate all the work that you've done, Bud. Uh, thank you. It's really great to see you all here. We've been, uh, as Matthew said, working super hard for you all in the future street board. So, um, I have to thank Megan, especially for involving me and Isla and several others directly with Bud Melton and sort of uh, getting a lot of local knowledge that he couldn't necessarily get on his own. And then Bud Melton himself has been doing all the work, did a really good job. So, uh, maybe some of you don't know me. Uh, Stephen Peterson, I studied GIS, Louisiana Tech, moved here in 2013, uh, and since starting my master's at UNO and transportation planning. So, I'm had a had class this weekend, learned a ton about uh, So I learned a ton about uh, the different projects that New Orleans got going on. Uh, in the past 10 years, right, they pretty much rebuilt the city and huge capital investments in biking. Some of them uh, have done really well, some of them have got a lot of public backlash. So it's important to look at those examples as a you know, local city that we can say, maybe we want to do that or not. But, so I just wanted to share with you a little bit of what I learned, uh, hopefully, and then kind of talk about what the plan is and some of the examples of uh, different bike lanes. Because I honestly, like just this weekend, learned about different types of lanes that I didn't really know about before. So I figured that if I didn't know about them, maybe some of you did. So I'm not the greatest public speaker. Uh, so as I practice throughout my early 20s, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this one. So we talk about bike friendly cities a lot. What does that mean? Well, a bike friendly city probably looks very different from person to person. Some folks are going to bike no matter what the situation. Some require a bit more infrastructure. Most people are looking for a safe and accessible route to their destination before they switch from car to bike. All of us want and need better bicycle pedestrian accessibility. I believe it is a civil right, and it's one that we've taken away by building an automobile dependent country. So in many ways, Shreveport is fairly bike friendly. The city center is very compact. It was built long enough ago that it was built more around the streetcar, bicycle, and walking versus an automobile. But we do have a lot of connectivity and education issues. Neighborhoods don't link with, des don't link with destinations. Large highways create islands of isolation. Drivers aren't aware of biking laws. Some cyclists aren't either. So this creates an unsafe environment. Education, I believe, will go a long way in creating a bike friendly Shreveport for very little cost. framework for an argument for bike pit access and then moving forward. So I bet that most of you here, you heard about this meeting, you're very enthusiastic about bicycles. You want bike lanes and paths, but there's a much larger population that actually needs them. And I kind of want to talk about them because they don't always uh, hear about meeting what, for whatever reason. They can't or struggle to afford a car, rely on bicycles for their job and their, and their life. So infrastructure that requires a car to navigate, I believe is fundamentally wrong because so many cannot afford this mode of travel. 
This is known as transportation equity, and we have a serious problem with this here. This plan outlines solutions and ideas that will take us in the 21st century, but it requires that you get involved, reach out to everyone that you know, and support it. It takes public support to push policymakers and give them confidence to be progressive and active. So I wanted to go with, like I said, some of the infrastructure uh, differences. There's so many. I mean, both of these are technically bike lanes, but there's two very obvious differences. One, you're probably not going to use. Uh, so it's, it's just not good, right? So the money spent technically wasted because the usage numbers don't come from that. So it's really hard to get additional funding. Over here, you have buffer bike lane with some poles. They're not very expensive, but they go a long way in making kids feel safe, you know, all ages. These are, um, this is greenway development, okay, so it's off-road paths. Um, I've chose these because they look a lot like Shreveport. This being riverfront, obviously, both sides of the river, we have a path there, but I believe it needs a little bit more development to be a, a real, uh, real viable option for transportation and recreation as well because of some limitations. This one uh, looks a little bit more like Fern Corridor, where we have just a jogging path or whatever. Um, again, no linkages, so you can envision something like that pretty easily. So these are numbers, and uh, not really related to anything except to show that some of the differences in um, bicycle infrastructure versus auto, and how much it costs, and you see how much space it takes up. It's really great. So these are also numbers that don't necessarily relate to each other, but I thought uh, they were very important. So I researched a bunch of census data. I was up till about 1, 2 a.m. last night. Um, I found that 11.6% of the population has no car of homes, right? So it's 9,000 homes, 9,000 families that are uh, you know, desperate, probably trying really hard to afford a car or using a bike or public uh, transit that is not necessarily uh, viable for them to get their job on time. The 18.8 minute uh, commute time is actually really good. Uh, 25 minutes is the national average. Um, I thought it was interesting to note because I think it's part of the reason that we don't have bike bed infrastructure and uh, a better public transit, even though we are a little bit better than most of the state. Because it takes so little time to get everywhere here, we have more infrastructure than we really need. Um, there's, no, there's no push, right? So if you're stuck in traffic for an hour every morning, you're very likely to say, hey, uh, I want another option, or I want some of these cars off the road. I want to use it, but I want everybody else off. Whatever the reason is, uh, we don't have it. So another 21.5% of the population is 40,000 people live below the property line. So that kind of links with that number, but 40,000 people who probably rely on a bike and uh, risking their lives to get to their job. So these numbers kind of show you how important this issue is here. And I think for years we have prioritized automobile and really created an imbalance in terms of access to work, school, and, and economic opportunity. I think we need to reverse this trend and create a street board that works for everyone, attracts new citizens, and appeases the current population. So, a couple of uh, really neat quotes about economic accessibility. But uh, I found this image and I wanted to share it because it looks identical to Texas Avenue. Obviously, they've done a lot of progressive things, but we have a canopy almost similar to that. We could use some uh, some different uh, can uh, you know, shape uh, words on there. Anyway, an off-road uh, bike access. Cars are kind of minimized as far as just the amount of space they take up. And you know, every time we have a festival out here in front of our space or anywhere on, on Texas Avenue. We see what it's like when people take back the streets, and it's really beautiful. So that's what it could look like. So I think that your input here today and in the future going forward is uh, the most important part of this process, and your continued enthusiastic support is what's going to make this plan really happen. With that, um, <laughs> ride your bike and show everyone that you do want this plan to go forward. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Um, 
Also, I want to thank definitely SHRAC for their vision and what they've done with the Transportation Hub and for letting us use their facility tonight. Thank you very much, SHRAC. Um, and with that, I'll and, and invite Bud Melton up. Hopefully, all of y'all have signed in. If you have not signed in in the back, please do so before you leave tonight. And then also, there's forms in the back to fill out questions and to list priorities in regard to what you would like to see out of this bicycle master plan. And so please fill out those priorities as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Bud Melton and turn the meeting over to him. And you're welcome to use this or sit up there, whatever you prefer. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I have no particular instruction on bringing a presentation tonight. And I appreciate being invited to uh, come and address questions and to help explain what this bike plan is and perhaps help you understand what it's not. And let me just kind of start off with, I think the, the illustrations shown here are great designs. Uh, some of those are at a different scale than what you'll find in Shreveport here as we were working on the plan we went out and looked at the current trails that you have. We looked at the streets, the grids, and you have a lot of uh, a lot of nice neighborhoods, a lot of great connections that can be made. Um, you have an overall transportation plan that, up to this point, really hasn't included much in the way of bicycle and pedestrian accommodation. So. This is a huge step forward, and it's great to have the enthusiasm. Now, the plan that we've developed is really a policy framework that helps to set the bar within the NLCOG and within the city and the parish that it will use as its roadmap to develop projects that are called out in the plan. How many of you have had a look at the draft plan or one of the maps? And that's great. Uh, you got the early draft. Hopefully we're getting close to final and hopefully your input tonight will be helpful in wrapping up the plan so that it can be adopted and be a part of your overall regional long range plan. That's the intent of this plan. It's, it's not a plan that's designed to show exactly how the infrastructure would look, that design takes place within each project. And so, as you've looked at that, hopefully you've seen things that you like, or things or routes that you thought would be useful. What we want to ask you to do tonight, Kent Rogers with NLCOG has put together a, a little one-page form. It's giving you a place for comments. And he would like for you to list three projects or project elements or connections or roadways that you feel are the most important routes to get signed or marked or redone so that they are more bike friendly. And he will put those together and those will become the input for the next round of program projects. Trust me, you won't be able to get through them all. So be diligent, fill in those out, uh, give us your input, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I've heard a few comments already, and I think what I'd like to do is kind of open it up and let me hear your comments. I wasn't sure what to expect when I was invited to come tonight. Uh, I'm happy to see this enthusiasm. I will say that several things need to occur. One is you all need to mobilize and be engaged with the process. Uh, it is your voices that need to be heard at the city, at the parish, and with your representatives who are on that decision-making board for transportation projects. A lot of these projects can be done with federal funds, some can be done with local funds. There may be some projects out here that uh, city bond program or 
maybe even a developer might come in and say, you know, we'd like to do a development with X number of housing units and X number of square feet of, of uh, commercial space, and it's on X number of acres, and oh, by the way, we would like to include a bike trail that connects up between the shopping center that happens to have, happens to have maybe your favorite grocery store and your, your workplace, where maybe a number of people who live nearby would work and prefer not to drive a car every day to get to work. So the, uh, the maps are on the boards over here, and I think there's uh, components that have been drawn from the plan that uh, Kent has put up on the posters over here. Uh, at this point, let me just start by hearing questions and, and try to address comments extemporaneously. I'm kind of putting myself out on a limb, but let's start there. What do you say? Yeah. Questions? What I'm going to do is repeat your question. I'll try that first. Um, you said that it would be helpful if everyone like, raised their voices. Who specifically could we raise our voices to or at? Okay, the question is raise your voices. Who to? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> You know, it's easy for us to think, oh, well, if we hear you, we'll, we'll know that you're out there. But every one of you is in a, in a place, you know, it's, it's kind of funny when I hear somebody say, well, you need to run for council so you have more power. Uh-uh. When you say you're just a citizen, that's the most powerful person on the planet. Because you have the ability to speak your voice. We're in a free country. You can speak your mind. You can write to the paper. You can write to your elected officials. You can write to your state senator. You can write to your congressperson. Uh, make your voice known. And the more of that kind of communication that gets out, the more those who are being elected to serve your needs hear that and know that they need to include those components in their decisions. Now that's. That's not an easy answer, and I will tell you, in Washington, uh, there's this constant level of, of inability to make the final decision that results in a what should be a six-year funding framework that the states can rely on for their transportation dollars. Uh, I will tell you that the agencies at the federal level have done a good job of developing guidance that is very inclusive. And it, it really calls for equal consideration for all modes. That started in the early 90s, and it is robust in its bureaucratic support. And I hate to use the word bureaucratic support, but that's the source of those dollars. It's your gas tax dollars that go to Washington and get channeled back to the states, most of it, <laughs> and get spent on the kinds of infrastructure that you want. So if you like to ride a bike, and there's not a decent way to get from one point to another, say so. And, and say so by writing a letter to your elected officials, to your newspaper, you know, magazine articles, whatever. That's, that's great. Yes, sir? Good question. That's kind of two veins. The uh, how did we get the input initially? Uh, NLCOG did have an online form on the website that people were directed. It was launched on the day of the Makers Fair, the uh, event that was here back in uh, April, I believe it was, and I believe it was open through June. That we received well over a hundred responses with detailed responses to the questions that were asked. So that was a mother load of input. We, we got a lot of insights on what you all are looking for. Uh, from this point, we have a draft plan that is in the agency to be reviewed, and we're hoping that the elected officials will review it responsibly and give us a set of feedback, a set of comments that then we'll use to guide how the document gets finalized, and it will come back to NLCOG, and I guess it's your board, Kent, who will adopt this probably in December, 
maybe after the first of the year. Not only was Bud at the Maker's Fair, but we held several other uh, public input sessions. We did one at, uh, and now my name jumps out of my head, the restaurant, uh, Maryland's Place. Um, several others, different different places, different arrangements. Um, basically just asking for a lot of input. Uh, and several maps out and various different things. Tell us what you like, what you didn't like, where you would ride, where there are problem areas. Uh, did ride was there you know an intersection that you know needed improvements or barriers between different areas and whatnot so he took a tremendous amount of input from those various different meetings to work into the plan is today smile everyone <laughs> and I want to say I've, I've been doing this for well over 20 years and dozens of cities all over Texas and even in Oklahoma and now in Louisiana. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I will say that this has been the best public involvement, the most engaged public involvement for a bike plan that I've ever experienced. And, and proportionally, the city of Dallas probably had more people come to the meetings when we were doing the Dallas bike plan in 2011. But the, the passion and the enthusiasm that shows here is, it's far and away the best. Stephen. Are you a cyclist? I rode my bike to work yesterday, and I walked to work today. <laughs> and I rode transit. So, yes. Some people know that, that you actually not only have a lot of planning experience, also ride a bike and that's part of your lifestyle. It is part of my passion. Uh, I was swung over to the uh, environmental side from the standpoint of the air quality and the environment back in the 60s when the senator from Wisconsin, Gaylord Nelson, was starting the first Earth Day. And I, I organized a bike ride for clean air on the very first Earth Day. And I owned a bike shop for 23 years. I was in the bike business for 29 years. And I have, for the past 21 years, been a professional bicycle and pedestrian planner for the firm of Bowman Melton Associates. So, Stephen? about how does it go from here to action. I'm going to hand this to Kim, to the different levels. Um, the first thing is uh, our board, Mill Cogs, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, not to be confused with Planning Commission, um, we will adopt it as not only a standalone document, but also as part of our bigger, broader, long-range transportation plan. At that point, we will bring um, both it and all the other pieces of that document. There will be a transit component to that, a highway component, but we'll bring each of those components to uh, the city, to the parish, to the planning commission for each of those bodies to also adopt uh, the plan. Now, our bigger, broader part of that is also covers Caddo and Bossier parishes, so we will also be bringing it to those entities on the Pickon and Bossier parish side. So it it have a regional context to it, but adopted from you know each each entity all the way up the water. Yes, ma'am. I think this is following up on Steve's question about how this actually gets adopted. So my understanding is that for the transportational transportation alternative program, which is one of the big federal funding mechanisms for bicycle and pedestrian access, that there's dedicated money for our region of the state that comes through the state. And the way that that money gets distributed is through your input to the state, I mean, your NL Hogs input, and that input is governed by the priorities spelled out in this plan. Is that right? Correct in a sense. The, the, the plan itself, again, as Bud mentioned earlier, it's, it's more of a, a policy type document. Exact. 
you know, exact descriptions of specific projects. There are some in the plan, but not, you know, a ton of them. Part of that will work its way up through the process through the years. The, there is a, a pot of money, the TAP, what's, what we typically refer to as TAP funds, but Transportation Alternatives Program Funds. Um, these are the projects that we will be feeding into that program um, to, to access those federal funds. There's, I have to put out a caveat that since federal bill has, the federal transportation bill has not been reauthorized in quite some time, the continuing resolutions in the smaller pieces that they've been doling out, they're holding back chunks of funds. So we're not getting full funding for any of the programs right now. Um, but as soon as a new bill is passed, that should open that, that bucket up, I guess you could say. Um, and these are the projects that we will feed into that program to access those can funds. You, can NLCOG actually implement these plans, or do other entities have to apply to NLCOG to implement these I think it's a combination. It's a combination of, of everybody working to implement. Um, the parish can certainly go out and do some of the projects on their own. The city can certainly go out um, and do some of the projects on their own. As the Bud mentioned, you can encourage developers, if, if somebody comes in to do a, a massive tract of development, um, the Planning Commission could certainly encourage them to, as you bring your plat forward, we would like for you to include these elements, you know, of, of a bicycle pedestrian element um, or transit element or other, other elements into those developments. So it's, it's multifaceted how it could get implemented. But it is possible for Correct, 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 correct. And then, do you have, you know, I understand that with the caveat that there's been restrictions on federal funding based on what Congress is doing, do you have a sense of a dollar figure that y'all are expecting in the next two to three years? I want to say if you, in, it's somewhere between 220 to 260, 260,000 uh, per year. Um, but again, right now, that's been cut way back because of the way, they, the way they're dulling out the money. But once a full bill is authorized, we expect it to go back to that level each year. If another agency wanted to apply to the state or to, you, to do some kind of bicycle pedestrian access program that wasn't spelled out exactly in the priorities that you delivered, is that something that you're willing to do as part of your funding? Yes. And, and again, How meaningful are the priorities in terms of well, no, because again, remember that most of this is policy oriented, not specific projects. So we're hoping that those that project that you would bring in, if, if another entity brought a separate project in, would fit into one of those policy goals and you implemented that way. Does that make sense? Let me also just say, uh, I'll add in particular, this is a plan that is a 25-year plan, but it will get an update about every five years, can't in mind, every five, five years, it gets an update. So every update cycle is an opportunity for you to expand on what's in that long-range plan. And what we did was develop a framework, a policy framework, and a basic infrastructure, basic infrastructure recommendations that are yet to be fleshed out as to exactly what they look like, exactly where they connect initially and eventually, and those can change. Every five years is an opportunity to update the plan. You may find that we, we have roots on here that just aren't practical and won't be for 20 years. And in five years, when you do the update, you may decide, you know, I'd rather focus more on this area here. That, 
that is if you use that as the only funding source to implement that. Again, parish can do some of these projects. The city can do some of these projects. You can encourage other entities to do some of these projects. Some projects will likely be integrated into other transportation projects so that you would not have to pull from that pot of funding. Um, a, a perfect example is with the Jimmy Davis Bridge. The new Jimmy Davis Bridge that will do the second span will include uh, a bicycle and pedestrian component to it. That would that would not have to come out of this pot of money. That would come from a different pot of money. Um, part of the intent with this complete streets program, of which Matthew mentioned that basically all bodies all the way up have adopted the complete streets program. As you go in to redo uh, a corridor or redo a street, part of it is to look at integrating these types of projects into there so that you would not, again, if you're, if you're doing a new overlay or a new striping project, you look at doing something in conjunction with that project so you don't have to pull from these funds. So there's multiple different ways to implement multiple different sources of funding, multiple different sources of, of persons and, and entities that can help implement a program. And to follow on to that real quick, is um, you know, how, how, how can we, and maybe this is one of our other officials, is uh, how do we make sure that, that when a project is, is you know, being considered, say, on widening the street like what happened on East Ed this, this last year, how do we make sure that those considerations Now, now, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate for 70th Street and the Uri Drive project and a few of those projects that are out there right now. you got to remember those projects started 15, 20 years ago. You can't just stop that ball and say we're going to start all over again. There's a few projects that have been recently implemented or are being implemented now that no, they won't necessarily have these components in. But by by each of us adopting that complete streets policy, it basically says to us and says to our our staffs all the way up that when a new project comes in, you have to start with looking at it as a full transportation corridor and a full complete streets program, bike, ped, truck, car, the whole works, and work it from that point. So you have to start out, for new projects, you have to start out considering it as a complete streets project. So some of those projects are 10, 15 years away. At what point are we going to start seeing changes? You'll start seeing some changes uh, within the next couple of years. We, uh, we actually have um, several projects in and around uh, Shreveport Commons that are programmed. As soon as that money gets released, some of those are, are going to be done fairly quickly. There's some, some other connections into uh, Allendale Ledbetter area that, that will be done rather shortly. Um, part of what we're asking here too is give us your one, two, three so we can find some of those, some more of those low hanging fruits that we can get implemented quickly, easily, and move forward. But you'll see some very quickly. Yes, sir. I noticed that Texas Avenue, Highway 89, is out there. Does, okay, so this is an out-of-pod plan. Does, is the U.S. Department of Transportation, is that going to interfere with any flight plans you have on that street? DOT, the state DOTD will have to concur with anything that's done on the state route. However, the state of Louisiana through DOTD has also adopted a complete streets program. So then what about, I mean, Texas Street is a U.S. Highway? It's still although it's although it's a, yeah although like U.S. highways and interstates although those are federal federally owned they're managed and maintained by the states that the state DOTs which which with the state they are. We speak a bit about sportsman's paradise. Uh, what is the Yes, can you just give a little information on that? I noticed the Sportsman's Paradise Trail System. And that's a state plan, it's a recreation scenic uh, corridor plan. He has got the uh, Sportsman's Paradise routes. And what we recommend on those 
which are mostly the rural roads, is like warning signs, advisory signs to alert the motorists. And we in particular came up with uh, about 28 interchanges throughout the parish that we feel should be signed to alert motorists getting off of the highways onto the surface roads of the bicyclist presence. So in the plan, we made a recommendation that conceivably the parish and the NLC can lean on the state and say, guys, this is your state sportsman's paradise plan that goes all over the state. We would like for you to sign these routes. And there's about 90 miles of routes outside of the city. It looked like a good fit. I don't believe that any of the planned routes that we put together and any of the Sportsman's Paradise routes, those are all on road. Did I see some routes, especially running north along the old Dixie and Belcher Road? Did I know it looks like the dotted line is on the level system? There may be a map layer, and, and I will say that there were several layers that we received from both the city and from stakeholders. I, I believe we looked at your exhibit that you put together, looking at the bayous, and I don't know if you all are following what Houston's doing. They just opened their $40 million bayou trail plan and park, uh, Buffalo Bayou Park, just a couple of weeks ago. It is fantastic. And it, it really speaks to the opportunity. Now, they're at a different scale. And, you know, our project dealt only with the on-road connectivity. But we recognize that the potential exists for the off-road connections along those values. Now, a couple of months ago, it was difficult to even imagine sitting down with flood control people and saying, hey, we want to put some trails on top of your bayous, along your bayous. But that conversation should take place. One of the recommendations we have in the plan is that there would be a bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee that would meet regularly, probably every quarter, maybe even more often, and that that group would forward recommendations that could bring in those levy district folks and have them sit down and share with you what their concerns are and what they might be willing to share with you in the way of resources for those kinds of connections. That can be a win-win for the city or the parish. Yes, ma'am. Um, just touching on my question when you mentioned Houston, um, can you hear me? Yes, um, I'm going to repeat it for you. For someone who hasn't ever lived in a city with a very viable bike plan, what would be the closest city to go see something like this? along the lines of the Shreveport uh, layout. I mean, Houston, like you uh, mentioned, yeah. Houston, and that would be great to go see, but it's not our city. So is there something within three, four hours drive? She's asked, where would be a good place to go see what might be possible to do here? Now, say what? Fayetteville, you know, uh, Little Rock. Yeah. Yeah. Lafayette, Bentonville. I'm hearing all kinds of great places that would be very easy to get to from here. There are a ton of cities who have been thinking about this for a long time. And it's great that you all are with the program now and that you've, you know, I've put together an initial plan that needs to get churned and updated every cycle for years to come. I'm sorry? All of mine are in either North Texas or Waco, urbanized area. There were seven cities there. Uh, we did the er an early plan for Austin, the Austin bike plan that's been updated since and is now on steroids. They discovered uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, if you get a chance to go out and, and look at like Phoenix or Portland, Seattle, uh, I can't name any smaller cities elsewhere that I've been to. But, uh, Tucson? No, I did not work in Tucson. I'm not working. Yeah. 
in Arizona. Austin and Waco has done a nice job along the Brazos River, and uh, they have a bike plan that they've not done much with the implementation of it. Now, honestly, that was 15 or 18 years ago when I did that plan, and you know, it's up to them. Once you own the plan, it's up to you to maintain it. You have to nurture it. It's like your garden. Your garden of places to run it. And, and I really wanted to delve into that more, but frankly, that's something that the city needs to embrace, the park department and public works and transportation planning need to get put their heads together. And that's, that's something cities all around the country are doing is realizing that the, the various departments need to work together. And you can make that happen. And having it in the 25 year plan We've mentioned it's sufficient to where if somebody said they wanted to do something like that and they started to develop what's called the NEPA documentation, the, the uh, National Environmental Protection Act that shows documentation of when things were brought up and how much public involvement was given on those, you've got good documentation that that came up right here for this process. So that could come forward and be part of that, that record of consideration and it can work in your favor but that's really a city issue that the city needs to engage with the levy district to make that happen and it's in Elcog can support that but it needs to be adopted in the, the plan as a component in the in the future we were directed our role in this project, and we had a very specific scope, was to do the on-road connections. And we gave a nod to off-road connections. And really, I, I tried to describe those with as much enthusiasm as you had when you shared those. And you were, your enthusiasm poured through that input. And hopefully I carried that water, but I will certainly as I'm finalizing the document, I'll make sure that we've mentioned that in as strong a terms as we can in that context. Yes, sir. Acknowledging that that is indeed the case, and you know, I would I would say that ongoing engagement with the public in a bike ped advisory task force should bring that to light, and that there's certainly every opportunity for the city to add that to the list of projects that go forward. Just to add a little bit to that and, and to Stephen's head nodding, that some of the, when you see a, a, 
if you see a, a, a zoning sign or a subdivision sign or something like that come up or a notice that you get in the mail from an area of a, of a development, large development coming in, by all means, approach the city and say, hey, we'd like for you to make sure they consider these types of things also. <laughs> um, one, one of the things, as a matter of fact, I'm Stephen Jean, I'm the Deputy Director for the Metropolitan Planning Commission. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, where's Flacco? Where, where, Mr. Kim, where he is? Uh, we, have a, we have a development coming up right now, and, and uh, he, he's been burning up my email, letting me know that there needs to be some better connections. One of the things that we're embarking on right now is the Unified Development Code, and that, that gives us more teeth than we, we've had before in getting developers to actually do things. Right now, we, we, we do a lot of charming. That we charm people and we try to convince them that they really need to do that, but we don't have the kind of tools that we really need to be able to say you have to do it. Now the master plan, uh, of course, you know has has is a policy document as well, but the Unified Development Code is ordinance. We are working on that right now, um, and as as the uh, Parish Commission and, and both the City Council are aware, uh, we have uh, been working on that for almost two years. We're getting closer and closer to uh, bringing that to. Uh, fruition. We sh we hope to present that to the MPC in December, and then and then to the governing bodies of their time schedule after that could be January, February, whatever it is that, that moving forward the way. Once it, we pass the ball to them and it's in their court, uh, but it does have a complete streets. It's not a complete streets policy. One thing I want to clear up: there has been a complete streets uh, resolution passed, but. There has not been a complete complete streets policy. The state has one. I'm not aware that the parish has a complete street policy. Maybe there's somebody can speak to that. But the actual policy document, uh, we don't have that yet. But in the master plan, we do have components that, that when we're dealing with the right-of-way standards, that does require complete streets approaches. And so once that happens, we also require connections. There's Right now, many of the things that you would like to see are optional. For example, having more than one connection out of a subdivision, getting subdivisions to connect. Uh, I, I ride, I go through, and I think I'm getting into a shortcut to go somewhere, only to find out I can't get through, I have to turn around and bike all the way back out again because I'm not familiar with that area. One of the things that we would like to see moving forward is actually being able to require those connections where today they're optional. So this, this is some of the things that once we have those tools into place, when we're dealing with developers, we can actually say, this is what you have to do. This is not what something we would, we would like you to do. And just to clarify, that's for the city of Shreveport and not necessarily for other cities in the parish or the parish. Plus five miles. Plus five miles. Okay, got it. Any other questions? Okay, let me ask you all to be sure and get one of the comment forms. Be sure and name at least three roadways or streets or elements on the map that you think need to go forward in the first phase of implementation so that when this goes to the parish and goes to NLCOG and gets approved as part of the long range plan, there is a go by that will guide the first decisions out of the sheet. Because the money will be coming forward and I think it's safe to assume that Congress will eventually reauthorize the six year funding bill. I'll try not to jinx it. I've, I've seen a number of them come and go, and they always come back. <laughs> it's a very real program, and say what you will, government is for the people, and it is our government, and they will continue to fund our transportation infrastructure, and will fall apart if they don't. So, any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Good question. All right. 
To answer that question is, we're not designing what the facilities look like. We are pointing to guidance. Much of it looks like that. And it's going to be up to the projects designers, the city staff, the NLCOG staff, the parish staff, who are engaged with their design consultants, the engineers and all the other professionals on that team to come up with those elements that are satisfactory and meet those designs that you would like to see. And, and just, I will say that the plan does encourage the, the NLCOG and the stakeholders to engage employers to better accommodate bicycling as a mode of transportation and walking for that matter and transit use for that matter. And a program that we rolled out in the North Central Texas area back in the late 90s was an encouragement program. We worked with the 25 largest employers and their real estate management people to identify places and, uh, to put the bike racks where they had secure long-term parking for a full shift or for customer parking, which is short-term, and to even install showers and lockers and a place to change clothes. That takes some advocacy on the part of the stakeholders. You know, where you work, needs to hear from you. You might speak to your managers and see if the campus, if, if it's on a large campus, see if they're willing to figure out a way to have arrival by bike or on foot. Yes, sir. The plan doesn't include bike racks per se, but we talk about bike racks and the placement. And a tree is not a good place to lock a bike. So, and, and you know, that's a, those transportation enhancement funds, you could use those for bike racks. You could use those for other things. And, and before we go off on to other things, I want to give, use the term for the millennials, I guess, I want to give a shout out to Sport Train. Uh, we have an individual from Sport Train here. Sportram was the first transit system in the state of Louisiana to have bike, bike racks on every single one. I believe Councilman Everson would like to make a few comments. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, it's uh, great to be listening to everybody's enthusiasm and some of um, the conversations that were had here today. And I want to use this as an opportunity to encourage everybody um, you know, the last time we did a uh, general obligation bond for the city of Shreveport was in 2011. And the, uh, there was a committee of citizens uh, that started meeting in 2009 to determine the projects that would go into that general obligation bond. Um, so the way that works, it's a citizen-led, citizen-driven effort where people come together and there's like a list of projects and priorities that are out there and they're categorized in different ways. And, and we as a city look to see what, what do the citizens want the most, what is the top priorities. And one of the things that just narrowly missed the cut last time were bike lanes. And it was something we were actually really kind of excited about moving forward with. And it didn't, didn't catch the interest of the, of the citizen committee at that time. I think that would be different now. You know, I think there is a growing movement and there's enough support that that would, that would make that cut. And, uh, you know, so I just say that to say this would be a wonderful resource to have a master plan in place. We wouldn't have had one of these, obviously, at the time. So now knowing where it would be most effective to, to add these bike lanes, it's probably a blessing in disguise that it didn't move forward back at the time when we thought about doing it because we would have been sort of willy-nilly just putting them where we assumed they might work, you know. Um, but having a, a study in place can help those be a lot more successful. So uh, keep in mind and... and um, and remember when those conversations start um, to be involved in that conversation and to move this up as a priority and that's um, certainly something we can look at doing. There's also obviously um, priorities that we can do 
uh, regarding road dieting and uh, smarter road planning and those kind of things. For instance, the gentleman just asked about bike racks um, and our uh, updates to the zoning code. Um, bike racks are uh, being requested in certain areas. You'll notice the new family dollar that's just been constructed. One of the requirements there was for a bike rack. Some of the new circle case that are in development right now, they're being asked to include bike racks. So we're asking private entities to start including uh, options like that as well. And I do want to um, certainly thank uh, the commission and Matthew Lynn for, uh, for organizing this whole effort. And also want to thank uh, Councilwoman Stephanie Lynch for being here today. Um, and then of course, uh, Lavette Fuller and other members of our MPC that are here. It's great to have a variety of different public entities that are here listening to people's concerns because we're going to have to work together to make some of this happen. And uh, so it's really nice to see a cross section of people represented and entities represented. So thanks so much. Thank you. I guess that, with that, uh, thank you, Kent Rogers. Thank you, Bud Melton. Thank you, Stephen Jean, Stephen Peterson. Um, Esther Kennedy, um, Isla Rawls, um, and of course, Lavette Fuller and Commission, uh, excuse me, City Council person Stephanie Lynch, and definitely everybody here, uh, Patrick Furlong with the city, Ken Ward was here earlier, and Robert Blast, oh, he's still, Ken Ward with the parish is still back here. Uh, Ken Ward and Patrick Furlong would be working with, with Kent Rogers and figuring out the feasibility of this. They're both with engineering with the two governmental bodies. And of course, all of this starts with you, the citizens, and your input that you give to your elected officials. And then from that on, moves to the engineering department to implement the plans that you're, that you're choosing through this, through this master plan process of the bicycle uh, pathway development. Um, do, does anybody in here have any comments that they would like to make or any questions, further questions that they would like to ask or that we got a, we got a free range mic here. Stephanie, the cord's not strong enough or long enough to go back to you, but you could come to it if you wanted to say anything. You're good? Okay. Anyway. Yes. Yes, Chris. The awareness campaign is built into this, and so there is awareness. And this is respect for automobiles as much as it is automobiles having respect for the bicyclist. And so it's, it's a two-way street, and I know that it involves a lot of bicycles um, obeying the laws of the automobiles. And so bicycle safety is included in this, um, and bicycle awareness is as much a part of this as anything that Bud Melton brought up as far as leaving the major thoroughfares when you're going from a higher speed to a lower speed where bicycling is encouraged to bring awareness to the automobile drivers that there are bicycles on this on this road that they may use the full lane that that the drivers need to be conscious of that when we first painted the share roads on the roads just from Ockley to Gilbert excuse Ockley to Presswell to Marshall to Crockett in downtown, that little bit of pain brought a lot of awareness to the bicyclists for no other reason than people were calling wanting to know what is this symbol on the ground, what does this mean, why is this here, what rights do they have, and so questions were brought forth that, with that. The parish has its own sign making, and so sign making is, is pretty easy. We do have signs on what I call the, the glorified shoulder at North, North Lake Shore, which is considered a bicycle path, though it is probably more for changing a flat tire on an automobile. However, most of the bicyclists that I know that use it ride on the street and they take the full lane and they only get over on the shoulder whenever there's an, an issue with them riding on the road. And, and at least that's at least a step in the right direction. No, Kent, you wanted to say something a second ago. I guess to, before you keep going, part of my question really was also, you know, Mark and Matthew are talking about the signs and 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 the
what I had heard for the first part was some, some educational type things. And just to let y'all know, we recently received some, some safety funds, federal safety funds, that part of the, part of those funds will be going towards um, some PSA announcements and campaigns to deal with bicycle and pedestrian safety, um, safety programs along with that. Um, we also administer a program um, starting at the school level. It's called Safe Routes to Schools. So we do do some improvements in and around the schools, but at the school specifics, there are some bicycle and pedestrian programs that the kids learn from, you know, yay high, working their way up the ladder. Um, we have, I want to say there's 10 schools involved at this point, slowly adding them in, a couple, couple of schools per year. Um, so slowly growing that educational component, you know, from, from the ground level up. Yes, sir. that just a little bit from the standpoint of the bicycle is a vehicle and while it may not feel like you've got accommodation one of the things that would be an early uh, recommendation for the educational output would be to educate the motorist that the bicyclist is a vehicle anywhere in the state so any public road you can occupy the space. Now, I recommend that you be alert. I recommend that you wear a rear view, a rear view mirror or a, you know, keep track of what's coming up behind you. But you have a right to be on the road. Now, that doesn't mean that it's very accommodating and certainly it's calling out those particular routes on that form that will go a long way toward prioritizing what gets done first. Did that answer your question? Somewhat. What did I miss? be in the plan is have you looked at that road I, I don't remember off the top of my head if we had shown that but if you would show me that on the map when we finish up here I'd like to see that Matthew did you have anything else uh, I encourage everybody to stick around for a few minutes I believe we have the building until 8 p.m. Um, the maps are up um, if you have any questions that you want to ask any of us directly, um, all of us are going to stay here. And so thank you so much for coming this evening. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, mlynn at caddo.org. If any of you have not received a digital copy of this, if you send me an email, I will send it to you digitally. Um, again, M is in Matthew, Lynn, L-I-N-N at caddo.org, and I will send it to you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your participation and, and thank you for being concerned about bicycle safety.